Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 27. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from thenifejunkie.com. Welcome to today's episode, and we've got a lot to uh, talk about, and it's going to be kind of a different, and I say that a lot, a different episode, but today we're going to kind of take a look at some of the frequently asked questions or most commented on type things uh, from the Knife Junkie videos and from the podcast and from Instagram comments and IM messages and that kind of thing that Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco gets. So uh, an interesting show, I think, Bob, where we've got a lot of uh, some basic questions, but some that are going to lead to to more involved kind of answers and and things along that line. So it should be a pretty interesting show, I'm thinking. Yeah, some of the questions are personal, you know, about my collection or about my uh, my outlook on on certain things. Others are just questions about uh, best practices in terms of collecting, storing, sharpening, that kind of thing. Things that everybody really uh, should need to know, and I'm kind of looking forward to it because I need that basic knowledge. So uh, I'm I'm looking for some of those more basic uh, things. But first, before we get into that, I got to say welcome back, Bob. You were on uh, vacation this past week and uh, hope you'll hopefully you had a good time i was indeed yeah i'm trying to uh slough the vacation off of me now so i can go back to work tomorrow right, but right. uh yeah we had a wonderful time i took my family uh my, my wife and i uh, took the family to a tropical location mm. a place we'd been before and Oh, we had a great time. Every day was perfect and beautiful. So perfect and beautiful that uh, after seven days, I started to feel a little itchy, uh, hmm. if, if not uh, if not for my sunburn, just from right. wanting to get back <laughs> home and into the thick of things. Probably more from the sunburn. I can't imagine wanting to get back to work. But hey, you know, sometimes the routine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes the routine levels you. You're right. I took one knife uh, with me on vacation, Jim. Okay. And it's the the good old pink cold steel broken skull with the snaggle tooth mm-hmm. uh, attachment on it. And uh, this is the second time I've I've gone on vacation with this. And uh, if you're if you're leaving the country and going somewhere, or actually, if you're going anywhere, even in the country, make sure you check the local laws. That being said, I stuck to the resort where we were staying. So I was in, in no real danger carrying this thing around. But it was good to have on me because there were uh, lots of sort of uh, like luau events and and uh, kebab events without uh, without proper cutting utensils. So mm. I had the cold steel broken skull on me. It's a great steak knife, mm. and I, I'm not shilling for cold steel right now. But let me say I've traveled twice with this knife, and it's great. It's lightweight. It's thin. It's capable, and uh, it's pink. So it 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 that adds a little cognitive dissonance that people ask. Kind of hard to hard to miss it, right? Yeah, it's like a picnic. Picnic knife. Right. But there are certain things. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, did you put it in your suitcase when you you hopped on the plane? For sure. I put it in my dob kit with my shaving stuff and and my shampoo and toothpaste and all that stuff and packed that in my uh, check baggage. Uh, Yeah, for sure. For sure. I went through my backpack three times to make sure I didn't have a little knife here, a little knife there, because... That'll just hold up the whole works. Right. As a matter of fact, a little a little can of uh, pure protein uh, held up the whole works. I forgot really? about it. It was in my bag. Yeah, I wanted to drink it when I got to the gate because I was uh, I was oh, hungry. Yeah. But we left uh, kind of in a hurry, as you do when you travel with the family. Right. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, and uh, like Bob said, always be sure to uh, be aware and know the uh, rules and regulations, not only of where you live, but where you're going to be flying through and going to. Uh, and please, you know, obviously, if you're flying, don't put any of that, uh, any knives or weapons, any kind of thing like that in your pocket. Be sure to put them in your in your suitcase and check the uh, the rules and regulations. Again, we're not providing legal advice, but other than to uh, be sure to check and uh, see what is allowed so that you do not get into any trouble. Uh, uh, Jim, one. One more interesting thing I just have to bring up first. We met an interesting uh, person on the uh, on the trip. He was a former NYPD guy. Mm. I said quickly, uh, I talked with Doug Ritter. We talked about how terrible the uh, the knife rights are in New York. He agreed. And then he said, uh, but I still have a, a box of knives I, I picked off of people when I was a patrolman. So he has a big <laughs> box of knives he grabbed from perps. <laughs> Maybe one of the, the perks. <laughs> Exactly. Of, of, of being a New York City police officer. I don't know. I mean, what are they, I guess they, they keep them. I would have thought they would have had to turn them in. He said they were all gas station knives. What does well, that mean? I suppose they were all cheap, cheesy, oh, okay. cheesy knives. So okay. It's not like he made out with any ZTs or anything. Gotcha. 
Well, you, you mentioned uh, Doug Ritter of Knife Rights. Again, that was back on episode 22. And if folks want to go back and listen to that, they can go to thenifejunkie.com slash 22. That's for 22, thenifejunkie.com slash 22. And you can hear that uh, good conversation with Doug Ritter of uh, Knife Rights and um, a lot more interesting guests coming up. And we'll uh, try to recap some of the past guests we have, too. But, Bob, I, I kind of wanted to get back to a point before I forget it. We mentioned you're being on vacation uh, and we uh, mentioned no YouTube videos this past week, so maybe some folks kind of figured something was going on because you always turn out one or two a week, but some, you know, celebratory news for the Knife Junkie regarding YouTube. You want to spill the beans? Yeah, we just uh, we just passed 1,000 subscribers on the YouTube Yay! channel, the Knife Junkie YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, uh, it was hovering for a long time, just, just south of 1,000. And then finally it broke through. I think maybe uh, the Elijah Isham podcast uh, maybe brought in some new new folks, and I'm super excited. And so that means uh, we're going to do a giveaway. Admittedly, I, I, uh, I haven't picked out the knife yet, but I think it's going to involve uh, a snaggletooth uh, a setup, maybe, mm. and uh, it'll be a giveaway knife Okay, for 1,000 subscribers. Okay, so uh, folks, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Just uh, what are we going to do? Just, just stay tuned, watch for a video announcing it, and uh, how, how are you going to how are you going to announce it? Well, kind of over this next week, I'll announce it. I'll put out a video, and uh, you'll have to be a subscriber. And uh, so that means if you're not a subscriber, you have to subscribe to win. So if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're not subscribed to the Knife Junkie YouTube channel, be sure to go to thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. That stands for YouTube subscribe. So again, thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. We want to make sure that uh, you're eligible to uh, get in on this giveaway. But again, you have to be a subscriber to the Knife Junkie YouTube uh, channel. So again, thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. And Bob, before we get into the uh, common questions, frequently asked questions, comments, kind of things uh, that we've got kind of planned, I, I, I do want to uh, mention um, Douglas Esposito, I think, was on the KnifeJunkie.com uh, episode number 25, uh, KnifeJunkie.com slash 25. And a uh, little more yep. news you want to drop about that one? Yeah, uh, Douglas Esposito of Attention to Detail Mercantile, uh, maker of fine custom handmade knives, sent me a text of a work in progress. If you recall, when we were speaking, I dropped to him what I thought the, the sort of the dream combination uh, in his blade language would be. And uh, that's a double edged fighter uh, with uh, blackened flats and tortoise shell handle. And lo and behold, the man is making one for me as we speak. Oh. And uh, so he sent me a kind of halfway through shot and it is gorgeous. And wow. I cannot wait. And this will be my first custom knife. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I am super super excited and I feel like it's going to start a trend yeah. and that I might have to start selling some things for real. I know I'm always <laughs> saying I'm going to sell stuff, but I mean it for real this time. For, for real there, real. For real real because there there's some people on uh, Instagram that I'm just whose blades I'm lusting after and right. I'm like maybe it's just time. Well, you know, anytime you have a guest on the podcast, Bob, just, you know, do as you did and drop a <laughs> super blatant hint about yeah, this is what not, I would like. And maybe it will work. it's not a work. gift, Jim. It's not a gift. I still <laughs> I, have to pay for this thing. True. But at least you get what you want. <laughs> exactly. Exactly what I want. Well, I know it's uh, maybe not a question on our commonly asked question, but frequently asked questions. But talking about custom knives like that, I mean, I, I can see the value from a resale perspective because that's kind of where I'm coming from in this is, you know, buying and, and selling the knives, you know, because there are valuable things. Custom knives are more valuable. Yes, yes, because each knife gets hours and hours and hours and hours of personal attention, uh, whereas a production knife. Uh, even even one that's made in a smaller facility uh, is getting passed around. And yes, it's getting hand finished. And, and I'm not trying to take away from smaller production uh, houses, but a handmade knife, a custom made knife, uh, that maker is spending a lot of time and imbuing a lot of him or herself into that blade. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they are more valuable. And, and so they draw more money and they right. they uh, they can get more money on the secondary market, too. 
what what should we be looking for when we're talking about a custom knife? Is it is it the maker? Is it the design? Is it uh, you know fix versus folder? You know, is it the handle material? I mean, are there certain things that we should really be looking for in a custom knife to maximize our investment, if you will? Oh, well, if you're talking about maximizing your investment, and uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of out of school here, but uh, right now folders are are hot, and it just seems like they draw more money. Though there are certain, you know, fixed blades that uh, from coveted makers that will bring in a lot of money. There's there's no uh, replacing the time and energy that goes into engineering good action on a folder. It's a more complex process. Mm -hmm. um, and and then and, and I'm not even bringing in forged fixed blades. That's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. So okay. So really, uh, you know, there are some fine fine art forged fixed blades that draw tons and tons of money. But right mm. now what I'm what I see a lot of and maybe that's just due to my own personal taste mm. is uh high-end folders bringing in the most money. Well, and I, I can't remember which episode of the podcast we talked about it. Uh, you actually mentioned if you find a knife maker, knife designer whose style you like, you know, that's a good place to go. That's a good uh, starting point if you will because you found something you you like, it's going to bring you value. And theoretically and hopefully will increase in value the longer you have it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think you can you can lock onto a certain kind of aesthetic and then work your way up the value or price ladder, if you right. will. Gotcha. Uh, if you like a certain kind of you like camp knives, well, you can start with something that's obviously handmade like a condor handmade in a factory in, in El Salvador. Mm. Uh, but you can move all the way up through s uh, smaller production companies to one-off handmade camp knives. Say you like tactical knives, you can do it the same way. Start start with something. Uh, if you like uh, Ernest Emerson's designs, start with a Kershaw and pay 30 bucks. You can work your way up to an Emerson or a ZT Emerson or a handmade, uh, hand-ground Ernest Emerson knife. There's mm. There are levels, so... Lots of options. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Lots exactly. of possibilities. So you yeah. ask what to look for in a custom knife. I say, yeah, I think you're right. Start where you like. What about kind of a common question that you get or a comment? It's about EDC, the initials, which is everyday carry. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the questions that, that we often see on the YouTube comments or Instagram or you know Facebook comments or whatever is, what's the best knife for everyday carry? Is there a way to answer that? Uh, is there a way to answer that? I'd say, um, I think you need to start with blade length, how much you're willing to carry because mm. it's, it, it's not an EDC if it's a, if it's a knife that's too big for you to carry every day. Right, right. You know, I, I personally, as you know, I like overkill and I, I, uh, I prefer a four inch blade for my main carry. Uh, but I have, uh, I have a couple that go way over that and, uh, I don't carry those every day, but I have from time to time. So it has a lot to do with what you're willing to carry. A lot of people carry a lot of stuff, big phones, uh, other tech devices. I, I try and keep that stuff to a, you know, limited so I can carry more knives, right? But, uh, lots of people like light and flat and then, and then blade length, three inch mm. to three and a half inch. But also doesn't have to do with what you're going to be using it for if you plan to be using it? Sure, sure. There is that <laughs> if you're going to be using it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, really on the whole, I would say a thin, thinner blade is better. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, really tough folding knives that have really thick blades. But unless those blades are really wide in in profile or or hollow ground, they're going to be very uh, obtuse at the cutting edge, which means they're not going to slice as well. And slicing is the kind of cutting capability you want most often in an everyday uh, carry right. task. Right. Say you're you're cutting a, an errant thread off of your shirt collar right. or you're you know uh, cutting up an avocado at work or something. Or, or, or an apple, better yet. You don't want a, a wedge. You don't want to wedge apart that apple. You want to slice it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, Spydercos are excellent everyday carry knives because they're thin blade stock and they're ground real thin. So they, mm -hmm. they make for great everyday carry knives. Okay. Is that uh, is that one of your then favorites? Do you have like a top two, top three, top five kind of EDC knife? All right. Well, my top five are... are, are uh, my top here, I'll just tell you what my top five EDC knives are. And they don't really make sense for what I was just saying. Uh, <laughs> but that's because I carry multiple knives. And for right. for doing those other little tasks, that rotates around a lot. Lately, I've been carrying a lot of traditional knives. But uh, anything from ZT, especially the uh, Emerson models, 
Uh, and I have new micarta handles on those, which I love. Uh, the Riot K2, I love. The Spyderco Yojimbo 2, and I just got the new one from Blade HQ. We'll talk about that more later. Oh, yes. The Hinderer XM24, which has a ridiculously wedge-like blade, at least the old one that I have. Uh, and the uh, my new favorite, the Bastinelli Dragotac. <sighs> Such a sweet knife. Mm. But none of those are really classical EDC knives. So those are mine. A lot of people recommend something thinner and a little less robust. Mm -hmm. Again, personal preference, what you're going to be using it for, how, much, how long the blade is, how, how weighty it is in your pocket. All those things come into, and come into play. Exactly. It's so moving along. Um, I think a lot of folks by now know the knife junkie is a martial artist, big into self-defense, that kind of thing. The question is, why carry a knife for self-defense? Yeah, uh, well... This one we've uh, we've addressed a couple of times. Uh, I think the question is, you know, why carry a knife for self-defense when when people have guns? You know, you're going to bring a knife to a gunfight. But I think it has to do uh, just with levels of escalation. And uh, uh, a knife um, in a in a um, in a tussle is obviously the very very last ditch effort to save your life. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just another tool. It's like that you would draw it uh, using the same instinct. Uh, you would in poking someone's eyes or biting mm -hmm. someone's ear. It's like the last, the last thing you have. Right. So that's that's why I say you carry it. I'm right. not saying you you square off and get in a knife duel. Right. But at least you've got it. Though I have a few fantasies about that. <laughs> uh, but yeah. But at least you got it. And and most likely you're going to be cutting cheese and sausage on that picnic and not cutting people. But it's just good to have. You know. Do you have a Do you have a favorite when we're talking self defense? I got to say anything by Emerson, anything that I can wave open is, is the quickest, is the quickest way. And now that, now that there's the snaggle tooth and, and also cold steel does a lot of kind of uh, uh, pocket deployment knives with their thumb plates and stuff like that. Uh, to me, those uh, are the ones that if I'm not carrying a fixed blade, those would be the ones I'd go to mm -hmm. go towards. All right. Speaking about self-defense, another question was the Karambit. Isn't that the ultimate self-defense knife? Uh, yeah, if you train in sea lot, if you train in Kali and you really know what you're doing, yeah, it's it's awesome if you're super duper close to someone. Is it the best because it has a ring? Um, maybe. But if you're getting in a situation where you're going knife to knife and someone's trying to disarm you, I mean, you're probably outclassed anyway. Hmm. So, eh. uh, and the hooked blade is amazing. There's, you know, it takes very little effort to do a lot of damage with the hook blade, but Again, if you're if you're in that situation, it's anything you have is the any knife you have that you have ready to use is the ultimate knife. What was that uh, from a previous podcast? I think it was uh, Drew Swift said it. What was it? Uh, the the warrior's mind yeah. or mentality? Any weapon, one, one mind, one mind, yeah. any weapon. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Douglas Esposito also brought that up. Oh, that's the true. Same thing in the Marine. That's true. Yeah. Before we move on to the next question, a more personal one for the Knife Junkie, do want to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by QuickBooks Self-Employed. It's your year-round tax solution. It's a must-have if you're a contractor or a freelancer, whatever you do, if you're self-employed, and you'll want to go to the knifejunkie.com slash QB30. Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free. All you have to do is go to the knifejunkie.com slash QB30. QB30, that's QB30. Bob, a more personal question that uh, has come up. Um, how many knives do you have in your collection? Have you counted that's them? kind of personal. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have about... Uh... And, and more importantly, does your wife know? <laughs> um, no. That's anyway, <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't listen to this anyway, so I'm okay. going to be honest. Good. Good. I have about 80 some odd folders, including the ones that I keep in various bags and in my cars, which is shocking because to, to have a, a, an answer for this question, I, I did some counting and I was really thinking that I was hovering around 50, hmm. uh, but I have a little more than that. So I swear I'm going to sell some. I right. swear. Right. Uh, I have a great many fixed blades, uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, because I have a lot of swords and um, knives that my parents have picked up for me, they're world travelers and everywhere they go, I have them get me something authentic from mm. the culture. So mm. I have a lot of stuff like that, ethno, uh, ethnographic weapons. And then I have a small collection of tops knives, about uh, eight. I love those. A uh, bunch of cold steel fixed blades. So I, I don't know. I can't really put a firm number on the fixed blades 
because I don't feel like going around and counting, but I'd say probably <laughs> around 40 fixed blades, right. uh, including neck knives, and then about 80 folders. Right. And so then I have slip joints, about 20 of those. Okay. 200 more? <laughs> a bunch. Just a bunch. But you know what? I'm changing my ways. There's No, there's always more to buy. That's right. What do you mean you're changing your ways? And now, well, now I'm getting my feet wet with custom knives. So, uh, so I'm broadening my horizons, I think. Be, uh, be less quantity and more expense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something like that. <laughs> something like that. Hey, speaking about collections and people that have knives, uh, you know, there's there's all different kind of collectors, as I have learned on the on the podcast so far, from folks that uh, buy a knife, use it, keep it in their pocket, to buying a knife, never take it out of the the box or container, put it on a shelf just to look at it for its aesthetics and beauty, and you know, try to retain the the resale value. But a collecting kind of inventory related question. Do you have insurance on your knife collection, and, and should folks get some of the more expensive knives insured, and, and how would you go about that? For real expensive knives, like things out of my league, I would, I would say yes, most definitely. But uh, if, even if you don't have knives in the art knife category, where you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, and maybe you don't want to uh, insure individual knives, definitely evaluate them and put them on your homeowner's insurance or your renter's insurance, mm-hmm. for sure. I've always done that. Just like uh, your wife's jewelry. If if uh, someone busts into the house and takes her jewelry box, you know, there's grandma's diamonds and her wedding mm-hmm. ring and that kind of stuff. You, you account for that. Well, if they come in and take your uh, Pelican case or whatever you store your knives in, they're making off of thousands of dollars too. It's just uh, in a different form. So make sure you uh, mention that on your homeowner's insurance. And I would think that would lead to having some type of inventory system so you know, at least roughly ballpark, what you have, how many quantity, what the brands are, the models, those kind of things. So Yeah, yeah. depending on how quickly your collection uh, turns over, take a snapshot every once in a while. Oh, that's you know? good. Good, good idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's an interesting question, Bob, and just, yeah. uh, you know, be careful how you answer this one. I don't want you to get in any trouble <laughs> have, have the, the popo come after you later. Uh, but this question says, with all the cool stuff you carry, do you always follow your local laws? Hmm. Uh, well, the, the, can, correct can, answer, the correct answer is yes, but <laughs> well, I, I'm going to this is what I'm going to say. Yes. Now. Mm. So uh, before we spoke to Doug Ritter. Right. A couple of episodes back, uh, I was I was just uh, actually it, it was even before we t- spoke with him. I did a lot of research on kniferights uh, dot org, and and saw some horror stories and realized uh, how I was kind of playing with fire. Even though you know I'm a uh, I don't get in trouble with the cops ever, and uh, actually my job uh, puts me in touch with a lot of cops, but. I just I just uh, discovered how free and loose I was with mm-hmm. I was I was thinking the knife laws where we are Jim I thought they were a lot laxer than they mm-hmm. than they are so I do now follow my my local laws right. uh, for a long time I didn't and, but it wasn't uh, but it wasn't intentional it was just not knowing yes it was not knowing and uh, luckily I don't live in New York City anymore where they'll throw you away and uh, for for just carrying around a, a Swiss Army knife but right. But still, uh, things are not what I thought they were here. So I'm a little more careful. I got a lot to lose. So Well, uh, again, that was uh, Doug Ritter of KnifeRights.org, uh, and he was on episode 22 of the Knife Junkie podcast, episode 22, so the KnifeJunkie.com slash 22. And uh, we are working on getting Doug back on a uh, future episode to try to get uh, some some recaps of uh, state legislative news and everything that's uh, been happening uh, over the past uh, few months. So uh, uh, stay tuned for that one. Hey, uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you a question. I saw um, a number of questions, and and this is kind of more your metier, resale. Mm-hmm. Uh, people wanting to know how how do you price, say, a knife if you're going to resell it? What are the what are the um, things you want to take into account when you're putting a price on that on that item that you want to resell and get some money back for? Well, I'm I'm coming at it definitely different a uh, different viewpoint than you because you know what it is. Uh, the features, the, you know, the knife steel, the handle material, you know, is it collectible? Are folders hot now? Are they not hot now? I sell on eBay, but I also sell on Amazon as well as some of the local, um, local sales games, you know, like Craigslist, Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Mm-hmm. For me, I have to look at eBay solds. Uh, you can actually go back and look at what items have sold on eBay and for how much. 
So I would probably, quite honestly, as I have done in the past with you, say, hey, Bob, I bought this knife at auction. You know, help me figure out what it is. And do you have any ballpark idea? You would look on Blade Forums and help me there. I would look on eBay Solds and uh, look at some of the other, like I said, the local apps and see if anything is listed and just try to figure it out from there. And, you know, the, the few knives I have actually bought and sold that way, I made money. I was happy. Did I sell them for less than they were worth? Who knows? Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. But I was happy with my, uh, my profit on those knives that I sold. So, again, again, not maybe maybe I don't know everything, but, you know, I buy very cheap. So most often I can make a profit without uh, without knowing too much. Yeah. And those those two knives in particular were beautiful collectibles that I would say you lucked into in a way. Yeah. Um, uh, just adding on to that, if you're if if you want to try and resell a, a non collectible knife, say you bought a cold steel recon one and it's just not to your liking, you want to resell it. I'd say take a look at the cheapest price you can find, probably Amazon or or uh, eBay mm -hmm. uh, used, like you just mentioned, and uh, you know knock a couple bucks off that. You got to remember it is in used condition, the condition, those type of things. But you know, a, a, a you know, for me, a tip or a trick, if you will, not really a trick, but any of the knives I have bought and sold, I give to you to get the spa treatment done. So yes. they, you know, they, <laughs> they, they look better and they're nicer and they're slicey is one of your favorite words. So they're nice and sharp and slicey. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you got to remember that that helps increase the resale value there, too, at least from from my my perspective. Right. Exactly. Are knives a good investment? And I know you and I have talked about this before, but again, one of the common questions, comments that we get on videos, podcasts, chats, those kind of things, are knives a good investment? And I know I have not been able to buy any knives at auction recently just because the prices have been so high. So I'm thinking, yes, they are a great investment. Yeah, they. I, I, I think they hold their value well. Yes, it depends on yes. how you use them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and when you're talking custom knives, Yes, I would say they are. But but as Dr. Frunke mentioned uh, and also uh, Jim Skelton mentioned, you know, it's not it's not a it's not a financial strategy. You know, you're not going to mm, you know, right. like someone might buy a Picasso for, you know, tens of millions of dollars and then sell it for a hundred million dollars. Like that's a good investment. Buying knives to to better yourself financially is that's just an excuse to buy knives, if you <laughs> ask me and if you right. ask others. Uh, but in terms of. Uh, Unloading something that that just isn't to your liking, or if you have a an amazing collection like Jim Skelton or or Doctor Frunky, uh, then you can sell those pieces for for what you have in them. I would imagine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you don't abuse them and and kind of knock them down. Well, I know uh, for me where I get my knives again. I'm I'm looking at yard sales. I'm looking at thrift stores. I'm looking at antique shops for all those you know, auction sites. You said, auctions, yeah. exactly. Uh, those type of places where, yeah, you're going to find the knife collector who maybe knows what the value is, but the majority of people there are, um, what do you call it, generalist, uh, mm -hmm. like I like I was when I used to have antique booths uh, in several different places. I would have to be a generalist and say, well, you know, if I can get this for five bucks and it's worth 40 or 50, yeah, it's a good buy. You know, am I willing to pay 20 or 30 not knowing? Yeah, I, you know, maybe once I start getting some some knowledge about an idea. So knives are everywhere and, and estate sales. That's a great place where I love mm -hmm. to find knives, especially kitchen knives, because oh, yeah. often the uh, they'll just open up the kitchen drawers and you know, say anything in here is a buck or whatever, or make a lot of all these kitchen utensils and you get a bag for five bucks or whatever. So I love going to estate sales. But mm -hmm. again, it, it seems to me that the better knives, there's always somebody there that knows really what they're worth and, and you're not yeah. going to get a great steal on them. Yeah, that well, what you just said is my biggest nightmare. Someone coming into my house, opening up my knife case and saying, <laughs> anything here is a buck. If you're right. Like, so telling my wife and my daughters, you don't need to know about my knives and how many I have and how much they cost. But if I die, do your research. <laughs> right, right. Don't let them go for one, five, even 10 bucks. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take no. a 10 pound bag of knives for a dollar. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's the reason I'll be honest. That's the reason when I was hot and heavy into the antique booths uh, and, you know, had several around town, I would love um, estate sales and estate auctions because oftentimes and it, it, it sounds bad when, I, when I'm when i going to hear this coming out of my mouth. You're not taking advantage, but 
at some at some point you really are because people don't know what they have and yeah. they just want to get the house cleared out so you can get a great deal. Yeah. And especially if you go in and, and bundle or make a big lot of stuff, you know, you're buying all this stuff and you can get it very cheap, you know. So that's a great place to, to buy knives secondhand, get good deals. Again, if, if if you're wanting to spend the time to do that kind of thing. Right. I mean, this reminds me of that video you sent me of the, oh, the yeah. guy who got uh, he got like 50 or 60 Randall made knives for 1500 bucks. Mm -hmm. And any one of those knives was worth 1500 bucks. So that right. uh, or, you know, somewhere around there. And that was back before we started the podcast. And I yeah. sent that to you and I was like, hey, I don't know. Is this this sound like a great deal? And you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, OMG, my gosh, what a deal it was. So Yeah, that, that broke my heart a little yeah. bit. Because yeah. you know that guy is rolling in his grave. Like, yeah. What? Honey, you let it go for what? You know, you got, if you have a collection, let your family, your, your uh, estate person know mm -hmm. at least a ballpark value of what you're dealing with. So as, as we say, they don't throw them in the kitchen drawer and say, you know, any knife's a buck, you know, take your choice. Let me take this moment. I know people ask me this a lot is where's the best place to buy? They say, do you buy all those knives for new? How can you afford that? Most of my knives I buy in the secondary market. And I just mm -hmm. wanted to mention kind of those kind of places, Blade Forums. Uh, I'm a member on Blade Forums. And uh, for 35 bucks a year, you, you get gold status. And that means you can buy and sell. Mm -hmm. And there's a vetting process there and there's a, a rating uh, process. So you can be more uh, sure of who you're buying stuff from. It's kind of, you know, the way eBay does the does mm -hmm. the reviews. Yeah, you get a, you get a, a seller rating, yeah. Yeah. And on Blade Forums, it's knife people selling to knife people. And I'm not saying that... People don't get cheated. Things happen from time to time, but it's a sort of a self-policing environment. USN, the Usual Suspects Network, is another one. They actually hold an annual meeting, as does Blade Forums, I, I believe. And then also, it might be a, uh, you, you have to be more on time with this, but trusted YouTube reviewers um, like the Apostle P. I mean, he does a, a Thursday night knife sale, and mm. uh, he's a, he's a well-known and well-trusted, uh, tried-and-true uh, individual on YouTube. So people like that, I, I, uh, I always tune into these, uh, knife sales, uh, mm -hmm. by guys that I know. I've, I've never bought one. I have to, I have to say, cause I'm never quick enough. If you have to have your cash in your hand, your pocket and your finger on the, uh, the trigger, as I said. Yeah. Up. And you have to be watching live, you know? Right. So speaking of that, which is le going to lead into a storage question, but from an investment, uh, resale perspective, when you're storing knives, but thinking again for maybe the potential of getting rid of them at some point, mm -hmm. do you keep the packaging, the boxes, <laughs> those type of things? Yes. Yes. The funny thing is, is I always used to harass my wife for keeping boxes. I'm like, why do you keep in the box to the crock pot? We're never going to like put it back in the box. Why do right. we have the box? And so I got my wife to get rid of all of our old boxes. And then she started noticing, what are these boxes full of little boxes? And I said, well, those are the knife boxes. I have to keep those boxes in case someone buys one of these knives. So it might be a pain in the butt, but chances are, uh, you know, your collection isn't that huge that it, it right. takes more than one of those kind of plastic storage crates. Unfortunately, sooner or later, we all are going to move on to, mm -hmm. to somewhere else. And yes. so uh, we probably should keep the packaging, uh, even if we have no plans to sell our knife collection when we're alive. Oh, you mean some, so when some, we cross over to the great beyond? So, someone our, will have to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may or may not get more money. Yeah. yeah. With the box. Yeah. Pe people like to, I like to receive things in the original box when I buy them used. Well, so, I know when I resell stuff on eBay, it, they always make a big point of, you know, original packaging and all that kind of thing. So, right. you know, it may add a little bit, but yeah. So then storage, you mentioned you have a big box with all these little boxes and those kind of things. But then, so does that mean you're storing your knives? No, that's just where I store the boxes. I keep, all right, I I keep know. the knives themselves in a, um, in a craftsman tool chest. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, and, and then I have, you know, soft leather beds for them all. I have, <laughs> I have that and that, and then that, that kind of spongy stuff you put under your cutting boards. I have that laid down. So, uh, when I open the drawers, the knives don't slide around. And, uh, it's just a, uh, an organized way to keep them locked up and to keep them so that I can observe them. Uh, I love the idea of the Pelican case. That's what a lot of people carry their, their stuff in, you know, the Pelican case that you, store microphones and, and, you know, high tech equipment in, mm -hmm. uh, you can get those with foam inserts and you can pluck out the inserts to fit your knives. The thing I don't like about those two things, 
the portability of it. You know, someone someone breaks into your house or apartment and they see that case. They don't know what's in it, but they know that whatever is yeah. in a Pelican case is of value. So they right. grab it and they they make off with your with your collection. The other thing is uh, you don't get to really see the knife. You just see the butt end because they stick down, you know, vertically down into hmm. the uh, okay into the foam. I mean, I suppose you could you could make it so that they sit flat, but that would just be a waste of space. So yeah, this this way is a little more permanent. It's heavier to pick up and lift, and uh, the drawers you open it up and they're arrayed and you know, it looks like a movie, right. you know, like John Wick for dessert, the knives, you know. Are there other storage options for collectors? I've seen uh, a lot of people storing their knives in knife rolls. Uh, oh, imagine yeah, a, right. uh, yeah. Like it, for silverware kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's a it's a, a large folded out uh, piece of um, fabric mm-hmm. and it has a bunch of little mini slots to put knives in. You can right. fold them up or you can hang them on the wall. Blade HQ se- uh, sells them. Spyderco sells their own branded versions. ZT. I think they all sell them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a good way. That's a good way to travel with them, as a matter of fact. And uh, I would think um, not take up quite so much storage space as well. You could exactly. slide them in there, roll them all up. Exactly. And and maybe not so obvious uh, to the criminal who busts into the room. He has five seconds to scan. He sees a Pelican case. He's like, I don't know what's in there, but I bet I could resell it. Right. Exactly. Um, just just a case, if nothing else. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Knives are metal, steel. Are they always going to rust? And, and how do you deal with knives that do get rust. Right, right. That's another another question that we that we get. Um uh, well, you know, they're all uh, except for a few steels like Spyderco's H1 or LC200N, I think it's called. Uh, uh, the one on the talk sp- those numbers. <laughs> the one on the Spidey Chef and a couple of and all their new salt series. Uh most steels will rust eventually. At some like most modern coveted modern stainless steels are very, very corrosion resistant. But some, like uh, like M4 on this new Blade HQ exclusive Yojimbo 2, they will rust and they will start to pit. And hopefully you're, uh, those are coated or you're keeping them, you're keeping an eye on them, wiping them down, uh, maybe putting a little coat of oil on them. But if you do start to see rust and that kind of pitting, all I recommend is a very mild steel wool with mineral oil or sharpening oil, machine oil works. And just put a couple of dots of that on the steel and just gently rub away the rust. It will most likely leave a little stain. But what I say is that's character. It's like a scar. <laughs> Patina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. A couple more questions we want to try to get through before our uh, time runs out here on the Knife Junkie podcast. I want to again thank you for uh, listening. We're kind of doing a kind of a recap of some of the uh, most commonly asked questions, frequently asked questions or comments that uh, folks have left over the past few months on uh, YouTube videos or podcast or uh, Instagram or just emailing the Knife Junkie. Um, here's an interesting one. What is the best GIF knife for non-knife people? Best gift knives for non knife people. Okay, well, I've had a I've had a chance to think about this, and I, I'm covering a bunch of bases here, and I'm going to give five answers. Okay, okay. Uh, sit back and relax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, but uh, the the first thing I'm going to say is if you're buying for your wife, which is a great idea to give a wife a knife uh, or a girlfriend a knife, so that they can keep in their bag, because ladies don't have pockets, as you know, gentlemen. You're going to want to not assume she wants pink, okay? Uh, That is something I've learned. You're going to want to assume that she does not want pink. That being said, I love pink knives. I I have two that my daughters gave me, and then I have a purple knife that they also gave me, the uh, my uh, Delica. Uh, But but don't assume that you're buying a knife for a girl she's gonna or a woman she's gonna want pink. That Mm. that's just kind of a rule I've learned. Um, uh, My wife, I got her a pink knife. uh, The first knife I got her, and she was like, "Oh, that's cool, but can I carry your American Lawman?" (laughs) I was like, "Uh, "Oh, okay." (laughs) That was back in the day. Now 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 I know what to get her. So. For a gift knife for a non-knife person, if you have uh, a lot of money to spend and you want to really, I-, I would say, get a Benchmade bug out. Uh, it's small, light. It's just over a hundred bucks. It's an incredible knife. It's got a great steel. I mean, I loved mine with the stock blue glass reinforced nylon handle, even though it felt cheap and cheesy. It's a great light little knife. I got the new uh, Alan Putman um, 
my car to scale is on mine and it's even better. So if you have, if money is no object and you want to get a non-knife person, a great knife, I would say get the Benchmade bug out. Mm-hmm. Now, if you, if, if you want to get the same kind of thing, a locking knife that's small, light, and really, really handy, but you want to spend 25 bucks, get the Tangram Santa Fe. Tangram is a Kaiser spinoff company and uh, they make real uh, high value knives. That means inexpensive, but great, uh, wonderfully made knives. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the Santa Fe has an, has an awesome little uh, Warncliffe blade comes in two, you know, comes in uh, tan and black, and it's just a great cheap little knife. And by cheap, I mean inexpensive. Mm. My third answer would be a Victorinox Cadet, uh, the famous Swiss Army knife. Uh, but it's this one has few tools, but it has most of the essential tools, and it comes in a really classy looking aluminum handle. The only thing about the Cadet you might not like is that it doesn't have the toothpick or tweezers, Mm. which to me are... uh, My favorite features. Yeah, yeah. So in which case I'd say just get another kind of Victorinox. My fourth answer is the Case Peanut. As you, Jim, know, uh, slip joints can be very, very handy. Mm -hmm. The Peanut is small and you you can get certain models of it for very inexpensive gentlemen can throw it in their watch pocket. Women can throw it in their purse and uh, forget it's there until they need it. Great little knife. And then my final gift knife for the non knife person would be a fixed blade. I would say get a USMC United States Marine Corps K bar with the Mm. uh, traditional stacked leather handle. Uh, That's, that's my fixed blade uh, option for this question. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just a classic on a number of fronts. It was uh, a knife carried by not only Marines, but the but the uh, Army carried a version of that, and uh, they still do. Uh, I think they stopped carrying that, but uh, all throughout World War II, all throughout the Cold War era, and it's just a classic American Bowie blade. But it's a it's a great utility knife as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I personally love the uh, USMC leather sheath and that stacked leather handle. Mm-hmm. I think that's the way to go. So, are those your final answers? Plural? Yes. <laughs> yes. Those are my. Five. So five. I, I think yeah. I gave a good a good range. Well, and if you want to get even more of a range, uh, again, this is timely at the at the time dated, if you will, but still a lot of the recommendations in there will be relevant. The holiday knife giving guide that the knife junkie did back in uh, uh, the holiday season of 2018, uh, you went through, I think, like uh, several different categories, I think, of, of uh, price yep. knives and had like five different recommendations in each one. So yes. if folks want to listen to that uh, holiday knife giving guide is uh, the knife junkie podcast episode seven. So the knife dot com slash zero seven. And you can hear that and hear Bob's recommendations at the time, which a lot of them are 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 still would be your recommendations because those are all knives you personally own and personally carry. Yeah. And uh, if the knives themselves, by the time they're listening to that, are dated, those manufacturers will have updated versions of those. So mm-hmm. Quickly, I think one or two more questions we need to move on through. So yep. uh, here's the question. What's the best way to get into slip joints if you don't want to spend GEC money? GEC money, great Eastern cutlery money. What if I don't want to spend a hundred bucks on a slip joint knife, a traditional grandpa non-locking mm-hmm. knife? Well, uh, you tell me, Jim, do you like the case canoe? Are you still carrying? I mean, the, uh, not the case, the uh, buck canoe. Yep. Love it. Still carry it in my, every, every day I have it sitting right beside my Swiss army knife, which is what I used to always carry. And now it's force of habit. I reach for that one instead of the, uh, the Swiss army. So carrying it every day. And that, that knife has a, has beautiful nickel silver bolsters. Yeah. It has uh, a beautiful bone handle and uh, two sharp 420 Mm -hmm. HC blades, which very slicey. Yep. (laughs) Very slicey. They take a little care every now and again, but Mm -hmm. that knife was 17 bucks. Hmm. I feel cheap now, uh, now that I'm telling you exactly what it was. But <laughs> you can get into slip joints by going to Walmart. And that's where I bought that. Go to Walmart. They have a, a selection of buck knives. If you want to bring it up just a little bit, you can uh, You can get case. You can get into a case knife. They have uh, many different levels of uh, expense. You get in there for a uh, high-value workman style hmm. knife. So, yeah, it doesn't take much. Check so out buck, buck slip joints. Yeah. yeah. All right. Don't have to break the bank. Yeah. Or, oh my gosh, I should say Rough Rider too. Check out Smoky Mountain Knifeworks Rough Rider. They make they make knives even less expensive than Buck and they have a wider range of uh, of those slip joints. So check them out too. 
Chinese knives. Your thoughts? Uh, on the whole, they used to be junk, and now there's some in, some of the best knives I have are made in China. Hmm. Uh, Riot knives, We knives, Reich. I don't have any Reich knives, but they make some incredible knives with their hummingbird and, and a bunch of uh and some other uh, pretty exceptional looking things. Kaiser knives, best tech. There's there's a strata, there's a hierarchy to me. Riot is at the top, Riot hmm. and Reich. Okay. But they're just making incredible, uh, incredible folding knives with incredible action and materials and fit and finish. And those are two different things. But the fit and the finish of these knives are, are spectacular. Even the best tech, the kind of inexpensive end of it, mm. they're making incredible knives. Hmm. So, uh, you know, they're giving the USA a, a run for their money. There, there was a time where a short little window of time where people were only buying USA made knives or trying to only buy USA made knives. But it's hard to do when there are companies like Riat, We, Right, Kaiser, Best Tech. But that's good. Competition is good. Right. Knife review videos. Um, most of the videos you do on the YouTube channel, the, the Knife Junkie YouTube channel uh, at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube are positive. And so then the question is, are manufacturers sending you these knives to review? Mm. Are they paying you to review them favorably? Talk a little bit about your knife review videos. Uh no, <laughs> no, these, uh, I pretty much only have interest in, you know, I have limited time, Jim, and I have uh, interest pretty much only in making videos about things I like. And I pretty much only keep knives I like, and I pretty much only buy knives that I imagine I'm going to like. Maybe at some point I'll get to the stage where I'm buying everything new just so I can try out everything. Uh, but I think I'd go crazy doing that. And this would be a full-time job, and which broke. would be awesome. <laughs> and broke, yes. <laughs> Uh, but no, no one has sent me a knife to review and, uh, and that's and fine. I got plenty of knives in my case that I haven't reviewed yet. So, and nobody's paying you. So you're not, as you say, not shilling for anybody. These are, <laughs> these are your honest opinions, I'm, right? Yeah. I'm ashamed to admit no one pays me. But. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, final, final question here. Um, if you could recommend a knife set that you could buy and be covered, what would it be? And I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think I'm, I get I'm sure it. It's kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, if you're going to get a, if you want a, you know, some guns, what do you, you, well, you get a pistol and a shotgun and a rifle, and and those are your basic, you know, mm. you're covering your basic. Oh, okay. So I would I would make it a three knife set, not including kitchen knives. Okay. Kitchen knives are their own thing, but um, I would say get a multi tool of some sort, whether that's a Swiss Army knife or a, a Leatherman uh, or, or or something like that. Multi-tool, uh, then you want a tactical folder of some sort. And when I say tactical, I just mean a locking folder. You want something strong. I like cold steel. I think for the, for the money, the value is, is incredible for the strength and the materials and the design. Uh, but there are a lot of great options. And then finally, I would say a fixed blade of some sort, a camp knife or a survival knife, hmm. something that uh, you're in your backyard and, and you discover a, a, a sapling that needs to go that you can take out and use to chop down, or you go on a camping trip with your family you can bring, or um, uh, civilization ends and you have to <laughs> run for your life, right, <laughs> you right. know, something like that. So uh, I would say a multi-tool, a tactical folder, and a fixed blade survival blade. Okay. All right. Good, good answer to that question. I think I understand it better now, too. So that is going to wrap up all the questions that at least I have here in front of us. But it does lead me to a, a, a plug, if you will, that if you have a specific question, we would love to hear from you and do it on a more regular basis in our podcast. Maybe answer a question every every show or something like that. Uh, call the listener line and, and leave your, your question there uh, at 724-466-4487. Again, the Knife Junkie listener line, 724-466-4487. And that is set up so that uh, you can leave a, a voicemail there. Then we can grab that and actually play it on the podcast and then follow up and uh, and answer your question from there. So, again, we'd love to hear from you on the uh, knifejunkie.com slash listener line, 724-466-4487. Bob, as we're uh, kind of wrapping it up here, I know you uh, kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier about the uh, Yojimbo 2 that mm -hmm. uh, is now new in your collection. I wanted to give you a chance to kind of gush about that a little <laughs> bit, if you will. <laughs> too. Thank you. Okay. Well, I love M4 steel, but uh, I, I just don't have much. And uh, Blade HQ has been in this terrible habit lately of putting out exclusive models with Spyderco. And... Uh, 
as uh, you know, most companies do when they create an exclusive, they fix one steel and uh, Blade HQ has it in M4. And they also uh, fix a, a, a handle color and they use what I think is beautiful, a natural G10, which has sort of a translucent jade uh, shade to it. So they recently came out with the M4 coated in black steel Yojimbo 2 blade uh, with the uh, jade G10. And, uh, and I was immediately smitten. I, and, and so mm -hmm. I spent literally a week checking my email uh, with, with some frequency, like a, like a 13 year old girl <laughs> checking to see if they, if they were going to, you know, give out a, a, uh, a release date. And then when they did, I was on it. And then, and then like most people who ordered the knife, we all got an email saying, there's been a problem with your order. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and so I called and Blade HQ was so cool. I can't remember the, the gentleman who answered, but he was, you know, I was number 50 in, in the panicked customers who got this right. email. So he, he took care of me right quick, but the blade came and now I, I hate to say it. I'm babying it. I, I, I haven't even carried it once. I don't even want to scratch the, the, the hand, uh, the, um, the pocket clip. So I got to get over it, but, uh, I love this knife. Well, maybe there's some knives you don't carry. Or are yeah. you one of those that I have to carry everything I own? Well, I'm trying to justify every purchase mm -hmm. and uh, not carrying. I mean, if I'm going to not carry a knife, it's going to be a lot more expensive than the Spyderco M4. So. Right. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be seeing a video about the Yojimbo 2 Blade HQ exclusive coming up on the Knife Junkie uh, YouTube channel. But again, want to remind folks uh, who may uh, have gotten into the podcast late, didn't hear the intro. Knife Junkie's YouTube channel has crossed the thousand subscriber mark. So, Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco has a, a giveaway. You want to talk about that a little bit before we wrap it up? Well, it, it's uh, it's actually embryonic in my mind, Jim. I got I to gotta figure out what the knife is going to be. But it's going to be a, a giveaway of a, of a nice knife. But you have to be a subscriber to the Knife Junkie YouTube. So if you're listening to this podcast and are not subscribed to the Knife Junkie YouTube channel, again, go to thenifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. Love to have you on board on the Knife Junkie YouTube uh, subscriber list. Become part of our community and also maybe, you know, get a chance to uh, to win a knife to add to your collection. Bob's going to wrap up uh, this episode of the Knife Junkie uh, podcast, episode number 27. We've covered a lot of ground here, but uh, I'll give you the, fast, uh, the last word, uh, uh, final comments from the Knife Junkie as we close out. I was just going to say, uh, uh, over this past week, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to answer many comments or anything uh, online because I've been on vacation, but please keep those questions coming. Not only it, do I like answering them, but it keeps me sharp and it keeps me thinking about... Uh, about my feelings and my philosophy of uh, philosophy of knife collecting and using. And if you happen to have been uh, sent this podcast or catching it on uh, YouTube, you can subscribe to the podcast and any of your favorite podcast players, podcast apps, that kind of thing. Go to thenifejunkie.com and you will find a page there under podcast that has links to all the different places we're at so that you can subscribe and get the Knife Junkie podcast sent right to in your podcast player. Or just go to thenifejunkie.com and you can listen right there online. For Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim the Knife Newbie Person and want to thank you for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.